Now, speaking about the church getting bigger, I've had a lot of people coming up to me asking me, Pastor, where's that BTI at? Where does that Believe the Impossible Fund at? How close are we to completing the first phase over that new building? We clearly need more room. So let's go ahead and give a little presentation real quick. I don't want to spoil it. Y'all ready for this? Believe the Impossible. We still need some drum roll. We didn't even have that. All right, here we go. Here we go. Let it climb. Let it climb. Let it climb. Here we go. Come on. $358,000, just, just amazing what the Lord is doing in this place. So I want to say thank you for your faithful giving in-house, your faithful giving online. Please continue to pray for what the Lord is telling you to give. It's time to build what God has told us to build. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move forward with the process. And we're going to believe that God's going to provide everything we need. Amen. Do me a favor, look to somebody next to you and say, my God's got this. My God has got this. It's going to be okay. All right. We're on week two of our new series titled Growing Pains. And the vision behind this series is to teach you that spiritual maturity is hard. It's going to hurt. It's going to be difficult because you're going to outgrow the old environments you used to fit in the old way of living that you used to have, the old way of thinking, the things that you used to think were fun in your life no longer are going to be fun because Jesus has set you free. But we got to grow. And that can be difficult. So the title of today's message is this, Growing as a Godly Person. Growing as a Godly Person. Last week, we talked about growing as a leader. Today, we're talking about growing as a godly person. Now, this might be the most challenging. Why? Because in order to act more like Jesus, you have to act less like yourself. Right, if you put it that way, okay, <laughs> it's a little hard, right? But to act more like Jesus, you got to be less like yourself. Meaning when somebody makes you mad and you want to say something, Jesus, what would you do? Remember the old bracelets? I think they're coming back again. The WWJD bracelets, like what would Jesus do? And so you have to act more like Jesus, which means you got to stop chasing your selfish desires your sinful de desires, the things that you thought you would have right now, but God is clearly saying you don't need it yet or you're not ready for it yet. So God is always working on our behalf, but I want you to see this. Okay, here is a crazy, powerful, prophetic word that Jesus spoke over Peter's life, but it's very challenging. It's in John chapter 21, verse 18 and 19. Now Jesus starts off by saying, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and you went wherever you wanted to go. But when you were old, Peter, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you. And others are going to take you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to let him know what kind of death he would glorify God. And then Jesus said to him, follow me. Like, can you imagine? And again, notice the wording at the very beginning. This is going to happen. Peter, this is going to happen for your life. I'm telling you the truth. Talk about a pep talk. You know what I mean? Like Jesus is saying, literally, your arms are going to be restrained. You're no longer going to be in control of your life. Other men are going to take you. They're going to lead you to the cross. You're going to be crucified for following me. And then Jesus gave him the option. You still want to follow you still choose to follow me. See, when we talk about growing as a godly person, this normally doesn't come to our mind. Let's be honest. Like, pastor, I thought growing as a godly person just meant, you know, I'm pray more. I'm going to love on people more. I'm going to help more people. I might even lead a Bible study every now and then and post it on Instagram with my Stanley cup, you know, showing the Lord's favor. God, God's got favor in my life. You know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm doing his will. But maybe you're saying, but pastor, you're telling me that I got to give up some wants? Some desires? I thought I'd be married by now. I thought I'd have a relationship. I thought I'd be going somewhere. I never thought I'd be in this situation. And now you're telling me that I have to give up my will. Yes. Isn't that hard? Yes, yes, and yes. All the above. You cannot follow your own will and the will of God at the same time. They will always compete with one another. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 states it like this. So I tell you, live the way the Holy Spirit leads you. Then you will not do the evil things your self or sinful self wants to do because your body will always crave what is sinful. Because what is sinful 
gives you your cravings right away, right? The lust that you have in the moment, what feels good in the moment. So your body's always going to crave these things. So when you're led by the Holy Spirit, you will not do the evil things your sinful self wants. But the sinful self wants what is against the Spirit of God. And the Spirit wants what is against the sinful self. They are always fighting against each other so that you do not do what you really want to do. Meaning the moment you came to Jesus, there was conflict in your life. There's conflict in your mind, in your heart, because now you want to go somewhere and the Holy Spirit's like, nope, come back. (laughs) Go back that way because you used to live that way. Remember the last time you went to that party? What you did? The mistakes that you made, the, the problems that came into your life, I'm trying to protect you from that. But the problem is we live in a Peter Pan generation. None of us want to grow up. Let's be honest, we don't want the responsibilities. And we, we live in a culture today where people are like, well, I don't want anything that's uncomfortable. <laughs> I don't want anything that's uncomfortable. And I don't want responsibility over my life. And that's why so many men today are running away from becoming a family man. Because that means leading a family and taking care of a family and taking care of the children and what God has has placed you in, what he created you for to lead, to work through you. But so many of us run away from it and we say, I don't want to be tied down. I want to do my own thing. And we abandon. And many of us come from broken homes where a father has abandoned you and he wasn't there. And maybe you said, I would never do that. But you're finding yourself in the same place. There's a lot of women that say, you know what? I don't want to be a godly woman right now. I just want to live my life to the fullest and receive all the thrills that I can experience in life. And I'll I'll do that when I get older because that seems boring. Isn't that how the world presents it? You don't like reading, be in the presence of God all the time, but you can have this nightlife. But again, it crushes your soul and your identity is lost. Because people will love you one day and they'll use you the next and then they forget about you because they got what they wanted from you. But the Lord wants to lead you into everything that he has for you. And so what happens is because of our culture today, we end up growing into our bodies looking like adults with the spiritual maturity of a second grader. But following the will of God is how we grow, kids. (laughs) That's how we grow, experiencing discomfort things that you didn't want to experience. I had my heart broken. But then Jesus showed up and I never would have known healing if I hadn't had my heart broken. I've lost some things. You know, following the Lord, when he first called my family to Authentic, we did as an evangelistic ministry in Louisiana when he first told us to go out and reach. I knew that meant losing our house. We had to sell our house to do that. Um, I don't know if I've ever shared that before. But I also know that the Lord was providing everything that we needed. And it ended up being a blessing because when God said move to North Carolina, we didn't have a house to sell. We were free to go. And so sometimes it may seem hard to give up the things that you're holding on to, but the Lord is trying to release you to something better. But let me ask you this question. Do you feel stuck? Like it's hard to grow, but it's harder to stay in misery. It's it's harder to stay in everything that feels chaotic and like it's falling down. And God is saying it's time to spiritually grow uh, grow and mature, but you're staying stuck in a season where you're still bitter over something that happened 10 years ago. You're still there when God says, grow. And you won't grow until you forgive. And as long as you hold on to it, guess what? You're never going to move on. It's time to Bro. And so I'm looking at Peter's life. Like Jesus said this to Peter, you gotta, you're gonna go to the cross, Peter. You're gonna give up everything for me. And, and something I thought was fascinating about Peter is that he is known as a leader of the disciples. And, and something, I, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but every time the disciples are listed, guess what? Peter comes first. Every single time. Let me show you some examples of this. Matthew chapter 10, Verse two, now the names of the 12 apostles are these, the first, (laughs) Simon, who was called Peter, the first in Greek is protos. Not only does it mean the first, it also can mean the chief, the chief of the disciples under Jesus. Luke chapter six, verse 14 is another example of this Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, Peter's brother, and, and so on. And this even continues out of the book of Acts. Acts chapter one, verse 13, here are the names of those who are present. Peter, 
Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, and, and so on. Peter was always listed first. Every time you see the disciples mentioned, if he was there, he was first. And he was also the first to take some risk. He was the first to move by faith. He was the first to declare that Jesus was the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the Yeshua HaMashiach. You're, you're everything. What do you think Jesus said after that? Let's look. Luke chapter nine, verse 20. Then he, talking about Jesus, asked them, but who do you say I am? And Peter replied, you are the Messiah sent from God. And you would think Jesus would say, congratulations, life's going to be easy now. You got the answer. Verse 23 and 24. He then said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. The truth has just been revealed that Jesus is the son of God, the Messiah that came to rescue us. But now Jesus is saying, but listen, you got to release your control. You got to trust God more than you trust yourself. Because the last time you try to control the situation, what happened? That that relationship is ruined, isn't it? You no longer speak with each other because you did not listen to me. Jesus is saying, you're going to have to give up some things that you're addicted to. Some things that make you feel good in the moment are some things that you depend on. And last week, we talked about a really hard subject. Sometimes there's a pruning process in your life, meaning God is going to take people out of your life in order for you to grow. But the thing about the pruning process, here's where it's hard. And and a godly friend told me this, and I never forgot it. The pruning process, sometimes when it's taken away, imagine my leg being taken away, but a new leg growing stronger, right? One that's stronger, one that's better, one that's going to hold me in a more secure way. But immediately when my old leg is taken away, guess what? It needs time to grow. And so I used to lean on this leg, but I no longer can lean on it. And some of you right now, that's exactly where you are. God is doing a pruning process in your life. He's taking some people out of your life, but you're trying to lean on something that's no longer there. You got to lean on Jesus and you got to trust him. You got to listen to this. He he said it like this, take up your cross daily and follow me. Because if you try to hang on to your life, you're going to lose it. Meaning if you try to please everybody, you'll never accomplish that. You'll allow a lot of fear and anxiety in your life. And you're going to gain the whole world, but lose your soul. You know what your soul is? Your mind, will, and emotions. Meaning everything's going to be out of whack. That's what Jesus is saying. But he's also saying for an eternity, you want to be in the presence of God. So if you give up your life for my sake, Jesus said, then you will save it. But I want to encourage you today because for some of us, you may be saying, Pastor, there are some areas of my life I'm struggling. And I thought I had grown out of that. I'm still there. I'm trying to get there, and I just don't know if I can get there. Let me encourage you with this. The disciples did not mature overnight. The moment they ran to Jesus, they did not mature overnight, which tells us this amazing truth. Spiritual maturity does not happen overnight. It takes time. And you got to remind yourself of that. If you're still failing in an area, write it down. Spiritual maturity takes time, but I'm going to get there. No matter how many times I stumble or fall. So this leads me to my first point of growing into a godly person. And point number one is this, the choices you make eventually make you. Mm. How many choices, bad choices did you make last week, last month? Eventually, if you make a bad choice, what's going to happen? It will bring chaos, repercussions into your life, right? Um, when I look at the story of Peter, Peter was one of the first two to choose to follow Jesus and leave everything behind. That's what I love about Peter. But have you ever noticed how odd the story is? Like, have you ever really read it and imagined yourself like Jesus just showing up and say, come follow me and you dropped everything behind? Let's look at it together. I'm gonna break it down. Matthew chapter four, verses 18 through 20. As Jesus was walking by Lake Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Simon's brother, Andrew. These brothers were fishermen, And they were fishing in the lake with a net. And Jesus said to them, come, follow me, and I will make you a different kind of fisherman, and you will bring in people, not fish. Now, look at this. Simon and Andrew immediately left their nets and followed him. Peter was in the middle of work. He was working. This was his full-time job. Jesus shows up and says, follow me. And Peter's just like, okay, all right, ready to go. What would you do? 
And if you go more into his family life, guess what? Peter's also married because later on, Jesus healed his mother-in-law. So can you imagine Peter calling up his wife and be like, hey, hey, baby, uh, I love you. Uh, I just want you to know today, Jesus showed up. This man named Jesus showed up to the job and I quit my job. Okay, love you, bye. You know, like, we'll talk about it later. Like, what do you do? Jesus just shows up and he drops everything. So I started diving deeper into this. And then I noticed a common theme. And here's the theme. God seems to call busy people. God seems to call people who show dedication, who are dedicated to the work that is in their hands. Uh, Let me just give you some examples of this. Moses was tending his father-in-law's flock when the Lord showed up in a burning bush. We talked about Gideon last week. Gideon was what? He was threshing wheat when an angel of the Lord came to him. Not only that, but Matthew was at the tax collector's table doing his job right in front of everybody when Jesus called him. And what I love about that story is that to that culture, he was sinning right there. And he changed everything the moment he followed Jesus. But Jesus showed up in that environment, even with Saul. Saul was very dedicated to persecuting Christians until Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus and changed his life forever. And so I started questioning, okay, God, why do you seem to call busy people, especially in the middle of a job? And I I believe the Lord revealed to me, first of all, to test what's more important, what you're busy with or what God has called you to. But we struggle with that. Because how many times has God called you to do something you don't wanna do because you were busy? How many times has God said, pray for that person? But God, I'm busy. I got to go pick up the kids. I got to be at this place. I got to watch the game. Come on. God, you know I love this game. Pray for them. What's more important? And I also realized an earthly boss, as an earthly boss, you want people who work hard for you, right? That you could depend on. God is the same way. He's looking for people that show hard work, show dedication, meaning the way you live also results in the way God calls you. Because I also noticed another theme. Jesus didn't call lazy people. He didn't call lazy people to serve him. Let me, let me say it like this. Jesus made it very clear in a parable. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 23, he said, the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. And idling this small amount. So now, guess what? I'm going to give you more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. God has given you some things to take care of, but are you taking care of them or are you complaining? Can't stand my job. Can't stand these people. That person always has bad breath and they talk to me one more time, tell them to brush their teeth, you know, like. (laughs) But there are people that, that get up every day and say, God, I'm alive today. Thank you. I don't have all the money in the world, but I got food and I got gas to get where I need to be. And I know, Lord, that you're doing something in me. And God sees that with the little he's given you. And guess what? He gives you more responsibility over time. And you're in charge of more and more and more. And then he said, let's celebrate. The kingdom of heaven is a celebration. When you get to the kingdom of heaven, it is a big celebration. Well done, my good and faithful Servant. That's what you were called to do. Everything that I placed in your hands, you stewarded it well. You did the right thing. So I gave you more responsibility. That's what he's doing with Peter. Peter is busy. He is a businessman. He is a fisherman. He's got a lot to do. And Jesus calls him. And he understood this was an opportunity of a lifetime. But I can't help but still think that Peter had to make the choice. And the truth is, the same for you today too. Uh, growing is a choice. Uh, staying stuck is a choice. <laughs> what are you going to choose? Are you going to grow in the Lord or are you going to stay stuck in the misery maybe you are in today? Do you really want to stay where you are? Do you really want that mood right now and your home to continue or do you want something to be broken and set free? Um, meaning his choice was either I stay a fisherman or I become a fisher of men. And everything about me changes. Now, do me a favor. Do not twist my sermon and say that I told you it's okay for you to quit your job. That is not what I'm saying, okay? I want to make that clear. All right, for anybody that puts comments online or anything, do not go quit your job. But I am saying, put the Lord first. What is he speaking to you? 
even if he's telling you to pray over somebody in the workplace, and you may get in trouble for that. But if God is speaking it to you, then you need to do it. Um, you will not grow spiritually until you learn how to submit to God's task over yours. God's task for your life. Um, I want to make it more clear. One of my favorite stories out of the Bible is the story of a woman named Martha and her sister Mary. And Jesus came over their house and Martha was very disturbed and she was angry. Why? Jesus was in her house because she was busy taking care of a lot of things. She was busy preparing the tasks, the food, the cleaning while her sister Mary is just sitting down. You ever been frustrated like that? You're doing all the work. Everybody else is talking and having fun and you're doing everything. So here's what she says to Jesus. Luke chapter 10, verse 40. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner. Notice the wording there. She wasn't preparing the big dinner. She was distracted by it. She was preparing it. And and then she came to Jesus and said, Lord, does it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Now she is doing this all for Jesus. But now she gets to a point where she's so frustrated. She's telling Jesus what to do. We do that too. How many times have you told Jesus, Jesus, I want the relationship now. (laughs) I want the house now. I want my life to change now. Jesus, where are you? I need you to do these things. And Jesus is like, you're not ready. You're looking for the blessings without being in the presence of the provider. You're looking for the things instead of listening to the creator of the things around you. And so what Jesus says to Martha, and I love how he says, he says, my dear Martha, 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 Martha. (laughs) Some of y'all get that. You are worried and upset over all these details. But there's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. She's discovered the right task. The only task that matters, being in the presence of Jesus. And it will not be taken away from her. And so here's the revelation from this story. When you focus on your task over Jesus, the only thing you're going to receive is anxiety and fear and depression and all these things. Why? Because you're trying to look perfect in an imperfect world. And it may work at times on social media because of all the filters and things you can do. But when it comes to real life, some of us are afraid to even have a real conversation because people may see the real me. They may see me mess up or know that I'm not the, the best at this. And so we're, we're putting all these things in line and we're saying, God, I'm busy right now. I know you call me, but I have all these things that I need to get prepared right now. And you're focusing on the task. And all you have is anxiety and fear. But then I notice, but when you focus on God's task first, you receive peace. Isn't that Amazing. And we talked about worship last week. If you were here, we talked about how when you worship Jesus, the the presence, the atmosphere of your home or wherever you're at starts to change. You receive this peace from the Lord. The same thing happens when you pray. And I'm telling you today, because some of you, maybe you feel like you don't know how to pray. How do I start a prayer, pastor? How How do I do this? Talk to God every day as much as you can. You don't always have to close your eyes and bow your head. Some of my best conversations are me shouting, God, what are you doing? (laughs) And God shouting back. But he always shows you his his love. Listen to this, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. The wording here is so good. Don't be pulled in different directions. Or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests, which you ask from the Lord, believe in it. Believe that God can provide and do the impossible and have overflowing gratitude. Thank you, God, that I even get to ask you about these things. Tell him every detail of your life. He wants to know everything about you. He already knows, but he wants you to discuss how you're feeling about it. Tell him every detail of your life. Then God's wonderful, here it is, peace that transcends human understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ. You know what he's saying here? He's saying that Jesus will come and guard your heart and your mind from fear and worry. The moment you start to pray, the advocate, Jesus Christ, works on our behalf. The Holy Spirit comes and brings the comfort because he's also known as the comforter. And he brings his peace into your life. 
At that very moment, it's like Jesus is at the door of your heart, not letting anything bad in. He's guarding it because he loves you. And when you pray, Jesus guards your mind and your heart for peace. But to change the direction of your life, listen, you must put down the secondary task and follow Jesus first. And so in Peter's eyes, it was no question. He dropped everything. Now, why did Peter just drop everything? Uh, a lot of people believe this is the first encounter he had with Jesus, and it's believed that he actually had another encounter before this out of uh, the book of John chapter 1. Because John the Baptist knew that Jesus was the Messiah. John the Baptist had disciples. One of the disciples of John the Baptist was Andrew. Andrew is Peter's brother. And Andrew is the one that came to Peter and said, hey, John the Baptist is talking about this man named Jesus. We believe him to be possibly the Messiah. They didn't know yet. They weren't there yet. There's still more maturity that needed to come within their faith. But we see this in John chapter one, verses 40 through 42. It says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said, John the Baptist, and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon, and he told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And I need you to see the choice to follow Jesus produce growth. The encounter with Jesus gave him a new identity. He no longer was Simon, but he said, you're going to be Peter, the rock. Can you smell what God is cooking? I'm sorry. I had to go there. For any WWE fans, don't look at me like that. It's okay. My wife rolled her eyes in the first service. All right, I just had to, just had to get it out, okay? But God is always cooking up something, something special for your life. And it's amazing how he changes your identity, right? You used to be an addict. People don't know you like that anymore. You used to, to fail and, and fall short, but now people see you as a, as a leader. You used to be addicted to all these things and you were consumed with lust, but now you've been set free and you give this testimony to other people of how to be set free. Why? Because the moment you encountered Jesus, he gave you a new identity. And the moment you followed him and made him your Lord and Savior over your life, guess what? You started to grow. And every bit of persecution that came your way, you're saying, you're saying, okay, God, you warned me about this. I'm on the right path. The devil's trying to stop me now. I've become a threat to the enemy. I'm not stopping. The choices you make eventually make you. This leads to my second point, which is this. This one's a little harder. Stop caring about comparing. And if we can be honest in this room as believers, most of us, when we get up in the morning, we don't check the Bible app right away. A lot of us, we get on our phone and what do we see? We see what somebody else just purchased, <laughs> what somebody else bought, what the vacation, somebody went on the, the perfect family picture. And you're like, I can't even get my kids to take a picture without them yelling at each other. You know, like, like God, I don't like my life. Have you ever said that? Who created you? Who put you here? At some point in your life, you allowed the devil in your mind to lie to you, and you believe that lie, that your life is worthless. Because Jesus proved upon the cross that your life means something to him, that he loves you. But comparison truly is the thief of all joy, because if you can't be content with what you have, you'll always search for something else that seems bigger and better. And I'm going to get into the story a little bit later, but I just want to reveal this phrase that the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and he Press it upon my heart, and it's, it's helped me whenever I feel like I'm being tempted to compare my life with others, okay? The phrase was, was this, that is not your story. Do not compare with what is not your story. For God is writing a story just for you, and it's unique, and it's things that you have to learn in order to grow. But before I get to that story, okay, remember, again, what Jesus told Peter in the very beginning of the sermon. In John 21, verse 18, very quickly, I tell you the truth, when you were young, you were able to do as you liked, to dress yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands 
and others will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. You're going to be led to the cross to be crucified. Okay, this is John chapter 21. This is the end of the book of John. You would think at this point, Jesus has already resurrected. He's already believed that Jesus is the son of God. You would think at this point, Peter would say something mature. You would think at this point, he would grow. You know what he said to that? Jesus saying, you're going to have to lay down your life for me. You want to follow me? And Peter looks at the disciple John and says, what about him? That's what he said. Like, what, what, about, what about that guy? What about him? You know, is he going to die the, the way I'm going to die? Is he going to suffer in the way that I'm going to suffer? What is going to happen with his life, God? <laughs> Man, how real is that? <laughs> I just thought at this point, Peter would be a lot more mature. I like say something kind of holy right there, like, all right, Lord, whatever you want. <laughs> he blamed somebody else. John 21, verse 20 and 21. Peter turned around and saw behind them the disciple that Jesus loved, talking about the disciple John. I love how John always described himself as that. Uh, the one who leaned over to Jesus during the supper and asked, Lord, who will betray you? Peter asked Jesus, what about him, Lord? What are you going to do to him? Stop deflecting what is going to help you grow. Meaning there's going to be circumstances and problems and trials that are meant to be in your story for you to grow. But if you don't allow those things to come into your life and face those battles in different seasons, you're not going to grow well deflecting everything and pushing it aside. Well, I don't want to have that conversation anymore. So you neglect it, but the problem doesn't go away. I don't want to be around those people anymore. It's fine. You can set biblical boundaries. That's okay. But if there's a hate in your heart, that has to be dealt with. Because in order for God to forgive you, guess what? You have to forgive other people as well. And you may say, God, they hurt me. Like They, they devastated me. They did something I didn't see coming. But the Lord forgives you every single day. And there's been many times that you have betrayed the Lord. You've ran away from God. I know I have. So many times God has asked me to do something. I said, no, I want to do it my way. And I would deflect it. And because I deflected it, or I would compare my life with other people, it's like I wasn't allowing myself to grow. So you have to learn to stop deflecting and comparing the challenges God is allowing into your life in order for you to grow. Meaning, let me say like this, there's a reason you're suffering right now. There's a reason some things in your life have been stripped away. There's a reason right now that you're about to see the blessings you're about to see. There's also a reason you're in a season of trials and it feels like you're being attacked and attacked and attacked, but there's a reason at the end of it, you're gonna see a miracle and your faith is gonna grow stronger and you're gonna know that the Lord is with you because he did this, this, and that but you wouldn't know that unless you went through the the fire. But with our Lord, you can go through the fire and not get burned because there's another one in the fire and he stands with us and he, and he protects us. And there's, there's times. And I said this in the first service, there's even a pruning process. Like I said, even earlier, there's a pruning process. And again, when you try to lean on something that's no longer there and you're like, God, I don't know what to do. I'm telling you, it's it's helped me so much. God's just like, that's not your story, though. You have to go this to become stronger. You got to go through this in order to develop. You have to be a leader. You need some problems to handle. You have to, to pray more. You need some situations that need miracles. And so this is going to develop you in a better way in order to make the impact you were created to make, and you don't know that yet. You don't know it to its fullest, but God does, and so you have to trust him. And so I'm looking at the text, and and Jesus responds to Peter in verse 22, and I love how he said this. He said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you, Peter? Like a parent getting on to a child, you know what I mean? Like, all right, dad, (laughs) I'm sorry. But as for you, follow me. As for you, 
follow me. Stay in your own lane, Peter. God is writing a story for you. There's some things that you have to do. His story has to be different. He has to reach different people. He's got to go to a different area. He's got to write this book called Revelations, and it's going to reveal the end times. You don't know that, Peter. You don't know what God has in store for his life, meaning do not compare yourself because you have no idea what their journey is about. You're looking at what they have. You have no clue how many struggles they face. But where's it going to go in the future? Peter had to consider that Jesus had a completely different destiny for John and still choose to follow. You got to consider the same thing. When you see somebody blessed and they have the things you want, it's just a different story. But God is still leading you into everything that he has for you. Um, Comparison is a, is a crazy demonic stronghold. It's spiritual. It is a spiritual fight because the enemy wants to get in your head and, and dominate your head. And if you look at the world with comparing everything, guess what? You know, wouldn't we celebrate as a church reaching 1 million people for the gospel in a year's time? What about online? Celebrating just reaching people all over the world in a year's time. 1 million people. Amazing. We would celebrate that. But at the same time, I know I can get on YouTube today and there's some 10-year-old that can reach 12 million people in one day. And some of y'all know that because you keep turning it off because your kids keep bringing it back on the TV and trying to get rid of that. And, and I realized when you look at the world with that type of lens, you're always going to find someone who has outdone your accomplishments or what the Lord is bringing into your life. I just want to be real with you. Um, I remember one night I was, I was driving. It was late. It was dark. And I saw this really pretty, nice, big church building. I was like, man, that's, that's nice. And immediately... My mind went to, I'm, I'm so happy for them. It's so cool what the Lord is doing. But then my thoughts started to twist and change. And I started to hear, how come you're not there yet? You going to get there? You think you can do this? You, th- you think you're a good enough leader to, to get people to that, that point, that, that promise? Is everything going to fall apart? It's been too long. What are you going to get there? There's other stories, miraculous stories where people did it in the first three years. It's year five. Where you at? When's it going to happen? And that's when the Holy Spirit said, shh. Okay. When you pray, you receive peace. I believe you, you receive peace because the Holy Spirit comes into the environment and says, shh, quiet. All your other thoughts and distractions and what you want right now needs to be hushed. And you need to hear the word of the Lord. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit just pressed it upon my heart. Do not compare with what is not your story. And the Lord reminded me, because here's here's what's so good, too, about when God speaks. He brings conviction, and then he also brings hope right after. He's convicting you to change something because there's hope for a better future. And the Lord reminded me of what he had, what he's spoken over this church, that authentic church is going to reach millions of people. And guess what? This, this place is going to grow. You can, you can see that. And it's all in his timing because he knows the leaders that we need to be able to do this. And if it happened too quick, guess what? There would be no room. There'd probably be a lot of people upset and leaving and never coming back. So God is working it all out. And then the Lord reminded me, guess what's happening here? People are being reached all over the world right now. I mean, millions. It doesn't make sense. Uh, last week, we had overflow. We had around 50 people in the lobby. We had 17 baptisms last week. We had people come from California. We had people come from Chicago. We had people come from Oregon. We had people come from just, um, there's one more place. I can't remember it right now, but, it, but it's just all over. People were coming in. And now they're saying they want to move here. And more people are commenting that they want to move here. And God reminded me, that's your story. God is doing something here that no man can get the credit for. I can't get the credit. None of us can get the credit. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to people all over the nation and even the world and saying, you need to be part of this. That's what God will do in your life, though. But you have to understand, what is your story? Let me read this. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. A heart at peace. Okay. In the presence of God, you receive peace. A heart at peace gives life to the body. Now, all of a sudden, you can live life to the fullest because you have the peace of God. But you ready for this? But envy rots the bones. Jealousy rots the bones. Comparing your life will make you sick. And you can feel it. And I, I believe some people in this room 
and even online, that's where you struggle the most. You're unhappy with your marriage because you keep looking at someone else's, thinking the grass is greener on the other side, and God is saying it's time to water your own grass. It's time to get things in order. You're looking at someone else's job and the promotion that they have because you keep complaining in what God has given you today. And until your attitude changes, you'll never get that promotion. See, God is working on you to be able to grow. So stop caring about comparing and let the Holy Spirit lead you. Uh, my last point is, is this, though. Um, in order to grow, we have to learn how to grow from failure instead of quitting from failure. We have to learn to grow from failure instead of giving up from failure. Peter, the first, <laughs> Peter, the, the chief, Peter was hot-headed but full of faith. He was the first to follow Jesus and do a lot of amazing things. Guess what? Peter was also the first to fail a lot. Peter jumped out of the boat and he walked on water. He was the only one that got out of the boat and stepped on water, but he also sunk in that water. He got distracted and he became fearful when he took his eyes off of Jesus. Peter also was the one that said, you're the, you're the son of God, you're the Messiah. And yet Peter's the only one that Jesus called Satan. Get behind me, get behind me. Because he was trying to please man and, and trying to protect Jesus. And he was getting the, in the way of God's will. I want to read this. Um, this is not going to be on the screen. That's okay. The Lord spoke to me this weekend. I was just in his word, and I just noticed something in the wording I've never noticed before. And it's in Mark chapter 8, verse 33. But turning around with his back to Peter and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter saying, get behind me, Satan. Why did he say that? Why did he call him Satan? Listen to the wording. For your mind is not set on God's will or his values or his purposes, but your mind has been set on what pleases man, what pleases people. Pleasing people can be bondage to your life and will always lead you away from following the will of God. You see, it's crazy that Jesus actually said, I rebuke you, Satan, because he was trying to please man. When he thought his way was better than God's will, that's, that's what Jesus is saying. And that's what Satan does. He tries to convince you that his way is better than God's, that his life for you would be uh, more fun and being able to live life to the full, 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 uh, fullest than what God has for you. And it's a lie. And, it damages our soul and it's just amazing to me. And Peter was the first one ready to fight. He cut off a man's ear to protect Jesus and Jesus didn't really like that. Uh, he healed the man, said, Peter, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> because he was protecting Peter. That would have been a crime against Peter. He protected him, he freed him right there. Peter, denied Jesus three times. This was his greatest failure. And a lot of people know Peter as the cussing pastor. But I don't think a lot of us understand the verse. Technically, it's not that he cussed. What he actually did was curse his own life. He spoke a curse over himself. He, say, he pretty much said this, may my life go to an eternity of hell if I know this man. Imagine saying that right after everything Jesus has done for you the relationship that he had with Jesus following him and now he's going to the cross and he just said curse my own life if I know Jesus and a lot of us have been there as well we curse our life every single day we speak these words these, these words of negativity and hate and destruction over my own life. My life is worthless. You start to believe the law. And you curse everything that God created you to become and do just because you don't understand your story yet that God is writing for you. And yet, we can learn a life-changing lesson from his failures. Meaning, this is so good, there is no failure too great that God cannot use. 
There is no failure too great that God cannot use because the only way you fail is when you quit. But if you keep getting back up, guess what? Eventually you will grow. And I'm telling you right now, some of you have fallen over and over again in an area of your life and God wants to set you free. And Jesus is right there to pick you up and to pick you up and to pick you up and to pick you up every single time until you overcome what wants to overcome you. For Jesus has come to set you free. But it's through the failure that we learn. And so then I noticed something crazy. Okay, Acts chapter four is very interesting to me. And Acts chapter four, Peter is being questioned by this Jewish council, the same Jewish council that crucified Jesus Christ. Guess what? It's in the same area where Peter denied Jesus three times. But Peter's different now. Peter has grown. He's, he's matured. He's no longer afraid of the enemy. Before Matthew 26, verse 74, Peter swore a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know this man. I don't know Jesus now. Acts chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, same location of failure. Peter says to the Jewish council, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is no salvation in anyone else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The only way to be saved is Jesus Christ. The same Jesus that he denied in this spot, he came back to the place of failure and recovered because of the strength of the Lord. Coming back to something he never thought he'd come back to. And I believe that's a great testimony because I was reminded again, this building back in the day used to be a bar. Some of y'all saying amen to that because you were here. You don't remember those nights very well, but you know you were here. And to be honest with you, some of our crew members were kicked out of that bar. But now they live for Jesus and they serve Jesus and God brought them back to a place <laughs> that used to hinder their walk to show them that God can turn anything around and produce miracles. Sometimes God is gonna take you back to the place of failure to show you that through Jesus, you can succeed. Verse 13 also says it like this, the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they were surprised. Okay, you wanna know what the answer is, the secret? to the spiritual maturity. It's found in Acts chapter four, verse eight. Here it is. Then Peter, here it is, filled with the Holy Spirit. Changed everything. Acts chapter two, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came and, and spoke to them and there was this power that changed their life and 3,000 people get saved and people keep getting saved and he healed a crippled man. And that's why they're questioning, which means failure is overcome by the Holy Spirit. When you feel like you want to get back into temptation, ask the Holy Spirit to give you strength and he will hold you back. And he will remind you, I love you too much to let you suffer in this way again. The devil wants to damage you. He wants to hurt you, but I'll hold you back because I have peace for your life. No more dry bones. But the greatest deception in our culture today is this idea that we can just quit anything that's hard. Uh, so many people today wanna to quit a relationship because it gets a little too serious now. You're starting to see the real me and so I gotta run away from you just so you don't hurt me. For some of us, we, won't, we don't wanna take care of our health <laughs> because that's too hard and so we allow our, our life to just kind of fade away sometimes. For some of us, it's our marriage. It's family life. It's living for God. It's just a little bit too much responsibility. It's a little too hard. I just want to quit it. And the devil just tries to come in and says, you can just quit everything. You don't need any responsibility. And if we could be honest, guess what? There's some people that look like they have it all together on the outside, but they're quitting on the inside. They quit years ago on their marriage. They quit years ago on their faith that God can do the impossible. And I want to tell you today, it's time to move away from the past and start to grow and believe again. Believe again. Can we, can we do something a little different today? I'm going to ask you to be bold right now. If you have been tempted to quit something God has called you to, will you raise your hand right now? Man, I see you. I see you. It's easy. It's easy to be tempted in that way. And so let me encourage you with this statement right here. If the devil is trying so hard 
to make you quit, that means there's something significant on the other side of that. That means there is a miracle on the other side of that. So it's meant to be hard. You're meant to go through some trials so that you can depend on God. But God is saying, do not quit. And so here's one more revelation I want to share with you before we close today's service. When I felt like my family was being attacked in many different ways and just tempted to quit or just be upset about things, the Lord showed me this one verse three times. It's Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Listen to this. So let's not get tired of doing what is good because just at the right time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If you do not give up and keep doing good, keep believing in the promises of God, one day the harvest is going to come. You're going to see your family change. You're going to see your life change. You're going to see that you're going to be called to what God has for you. You're no longer going to be afraid. You may move away from everything. You may leave things behind. It doesn't matter, God. I will keep doing good. Every time the enemy comes against me, I'll fight back by doing good because at the right time, the harvest will come keep doing good. Can I have you stand right here? How do you grow as a godly person? Spiritual maturity does not happen overnight. Understand you may still struggle in some areas, but the Lord is with you. The second thing, focus on your story that God is writing for you. Don't be distracted with everybody else is doing. And if you keep getting back up, you grow. You're not a failure unless you quit. So keep getting back up. And the last thing, keep doing good because the harvest will come. It will come. The harvest will come. Can we say that together? The harvest will come. It's going to come for your family, your relationships, your future, your purpose. And so right now, if you can't close your eyes, if you just need prayer over one of these things to keep having faith, will you raise your hand as well too? Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus for strength because growing as a godly person means we have to give up some of our own wants and desires and selfishness and the things that we want right now that we thought would make our life complete. But God, you know better. You always do. And so I pray Holy Spirit, hold our hand and guide us through the valleys so that one day all these people in this room and watching online will be on the mountaintops. And I pray, Lord, that they praise you in the valley just like they do on the mountaintop. For you are good always, even in the trials, as you are in the blessings. But Holy Spirit, move us and guide us and allow us to mature. It is time to mature and grow. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler, and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor, before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church, because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So, we love our Authentic family, and thank you today for joining us.